a racist bake sale. We have different prices here. If you're Asian, a buck fifty. If you're white, a buck. If you're Latino or black, fifty cents. That's like not it. right. You got to be on your goddamn mind. Is the cupcake poison? I didn't come up with this idea. I copied what some students had done. They call it an affirmative action bake sale. Why does that shut down? Here at Bucknell University, the administrators shut the bake sale down. The Students' Conservative Club said they just wanted to start a conversation about affirmative action, which does make it harder for Asians to get admitted, but easier for blacks and Latinos. But before much conversation started, they were shut down. So I ran the bake sale so we could see what kind of discussion the Bucknell students missed. I'm but trying to make amends for racism and punish the Asians because they have an advantage. They have such high SAT scores. No, that's not true. Because I, I had an Asian student in my class that was dumb as a cardboard. That's stereotyping. It is stereotyping. That's, stereotyping. that's not right. Affirmative action is supposed to help minorities that have been discriminated against. But Latinos and blacks who saw my sign didn't like it. That, that makes me feel bad because I'm both Latino and black. Should should I not do this because it might hurt people's feelings? Not yes. only it should hurt people's feelings, but it's just like out of sense of respect. It's very hurtful. It's very demeaning. And America has been a bastion of free speech. Oh, except for a few places like the liberal media, especially ABC News, where I used to work. No, actually, they were pretty good. <laughs> they pretty much let me say most things. The, the real bastion of political correctness and rules against certain kinds of speech has become the American university. The intuition tempts us to believe someone needs to plan, and the central planners know best. What reality taught me, no one knows enough to plan a society. John, you're, you quote... Uh, Friedrich Hayek, a pal of Milton Friedman, while we're talking about Milton Friedman, and Hayek, this observation that there's too little information to plan centrally, Hayek's writing when the Soviets are trying to plan, come up with five-year plans and so forth, but he's writing in the middle of the 20th century. Now we have so much more information, all kinds of data rolling into Washington, wave after wave, so surely you'd have to grant, for example, with regard to Obamacare, that even if the government can't plan the health economy in detail, surely it has enough information now about costs and procedures to give it at least overall direction. No, I can't agree to that. And even if it did, it doesn't know what you or I are going to do next or going to want next. It can't know. I mean, you may want every ounce of health care and you may choose to spend your last penny on health care. I'm someone who would rather take risks and have a shorter life. And government can't know it for everybody. Hayek also said, the curious task of economics is to teach man how little he knows about what he imagines he can design. And that's right on. Still and right on. It's my job to convince Bill O'Reilly now. <laughs> Good luck. Well, they said yes, and they didn't know I was gonna be there. Right. You sat next to Hillary Clinton, it went well for a while. And then what we, happened? We argued about regulation for half an hour, and then she just had an awful man. She literally turned around. She talked to the person on the other side and just froze me out. What but, does that tell you about her? Well, she's a charming person when she wants to be, but everything is about government must control this. Oh, no, we need government for this. The, the argument was about how people were having an opportunity to come to this Caribbean island because there were few rules and they weren't slaves. They chose to live under poor conditions to get work. And that's how America got built, to allow people to make their own decisions. She clearly says, no, you got to have all these wage rules and housing regulation and endlessly. And this is not news. What is it like to get the freeze out? <laughs> I had to admire her for it. She, she didn't do anything overtly offensive, but I just felt like a pariah. With 
And next thing you know, they change seats, and you have to, you're stuck with the former president of the United States. You have to talk to Bill the rest of the time. Listen to Bill. He's, it's like a, he's a tape recorder. You press the button, and he just talks. And he, he gets really close. He does. And then, I, this is the president. Am I crouching his space? I moved away, and he comes. And this is what he does. He makes what? you feel like you're the only person he's talking to. The drug war is the reason we lock up a higher percentage of our citizens than any other country, more than Russia, Rwanda, Cuba. But it's worth it, say conservatives, like Ann Coulter, which depresses the heck out of me because you're so smart. Why don't you get the folly of this drug war? My, I have one statement for you, the welfare state. No, people cannot do whatever they want to do, live however they want to live, as long as Ann has to pay for it when they can't hold a job and raise their own kids and buy their own food and pay their own rent. You get rid of the welfare state, and we'll talk about people sitting home shooting heroin all day. But right now, oh, and now I have to pay for their health care. So because we have a socialized welfare system, we have to give up all these other freedoms? Because people... Yeah, have... as long as Ann is paying for it. How about motorcycles? They be illegal? Um, no, because they tend to kill themselves. Same thing with smoking. Smokers die early. The tobacco companies won't tell you that, but smokers save the Social Security save Administration Save us money, money on Social Security. Good. So they're helping us out. Yes, but they are. But as long as we have a welfare state, we have to care what people do with their lives and whether they can be productive citizens. Now, if you got rid of the welfare state, then I would say, I, then I'd just go back to the Constitution. I think the Founding Fathers got it right. Let the states decide, let the localities decide, and then, you know, you have a 50-state competition. One okay. state will be legalizing prostitution and drugs and, um, you know, all the other things you wacky libertarians love. Another state, the nice conservative states like Alabama will not, and we can compare and see what, what policies work, what policies lead to a productive, happy citizenry. But until you get that. rid of the welfare states, not interested in hearing about welfare or uh, legalizing drugs. All right. Well, let's accept your argument that there's all this harm from the drugs. What about the harm from the law? What about all the dead bodies? What about all the people murdering each other? We're creating death all over the world with our law. Well, I mean, I think you could say that for for just the murder laws themselves. Um, people murder for lots of reasons. We have no wine murders or cigarette murders or cartels because it's legal. Not just because it's legal. Um, I think there is a, now Now we're living in the wacky uh, libertarian fantasy world of no welfare state. No welfare, let's assume no welfare state. So we're no moving to state. that and- Let's have no welfare state, but <laughs> yes, let's Yes, we agree on that. Okay. <laughs> We're assuming that. Now, I would want to see the results of Alabama versus California. I'm guessing that they would have different laws on the moral, moral social okay. issues. Um, I would want to take a look at that, and I'd have an open mind, but I do think there is a difference between drugs and alcohol. Um, people can drink wine over dinner without getting drunk. Um, smoking, certainly. People smoke and stay up all night working. A lot of work gets done on tobacco, whereas drugs are pretty much specifically just to get high. It's not, hmm, I'm but enjoying a lot of people the smell drink of this marijuana. to get high. Yeah, but that's more of a subsidiary point. But you think most people drink for the taste, not to get high? I admit, I drink yeah, to get a little buzz. <laughs> Um, no, a lot of people drink wine with dinner without getting drunk. A lot of drunk. people do, but a lot of people drink to get <laughs> high. We don't try to ban it. I mean, isn't getting high, altering your consciousness, part of freedom? People want to do that? Um, the other they difference should... between alcohol and drugs, for one thing, I do think there's a difference that one is pretty much exclusively get high. The other one is... I like a gin and tonic, or I'm having wine with dinner, and maybe you get a little bit of a buzz. But the other thing is, you want to have a few things that are illegal that aren't that harmful, <laughs> you know, because if daddy's smoking pot with him at the Little League game, then they're going to have to do something much harder just to defy mommy and daddy. But no, right now we do still have a, a um, stigma attached to, to, to illegal drugs, and we ought to be, I'm just saying we ought to be very careful before removing that stigma because it's very hard to go back, as the country found out, with Prohibition. And by the way, all during right. Prohibition, all of the alcohol-related um, diseases, accidents, murders, homicides did go down substantially. Murder cirrhosis went up. of the liver. Maybe cirrhosis of the liver went down, but murder went Accidents up Accidents related to alcohol. Murder went way up. We have a graph of murder. I, I don't believe that. Here's the murder rate.
How about Holland? You talk about the stigma. Holland decriminalized marijuana. Are all the kids smoking in Holland? Uh, a lot of American kids are. A lot of people Holland. go there to smoke. But what about the Dutch kids? I, I don't think we think of Holland as an economic or military powerhouse. I don't think we want to set that as our standard. And by the way, they're lovely people. <laughs> and for the record, 17% kind of, of Americans say they've smoked marijuana, 5% of the Dutch. So despite legalization, it's less popular. We deliver, we deliver. They buy commercials like businesses do. We deliver, we deliver. But real businesses can't lose billions every year, 16 billion last year. The post office loses money even though they don't pay sales taxes, they don't pay property taxes, they don't even pay their parking tickets. With advantages like that, how does the post office lose money? Well, here's a reason. Check out this little post office in Massachusetts. Hi. This is one of hundreds that on average bring in less than $700 a month. Yeah, talk to you. I don't blame her, but a real business would close a store that can't cover even her salary, let alone other costs. Never mind that. Congress says post offices must serve all of America, but there's another post office a mile down the road. In fact, there are five others within a few miles. Why do they need so many so close to each other? Even the locals see the excess. They should be cut back to probably a couple. There are a bunch of post offices around. I think it's kind of silly. Close these post offices. We're working on it. And, uh, well, what do you mean you're working on it? A business just does it. We're expected to operate like a business, but Congress has not allowed us the flexibility to operate like a business. Mickey Barnett is chairman of the post office board. On your website, you say, since Ben Franklin, the postal service has grown and changed with America. But you don't change. You're a government monopoly. You barely change. 250,000 less and fewer employees than we had. But you don't fire anybody. No. Nope. If government did fire people, the big government media would say things like this. They are hell-bent on seeing the U.S. Postal Service die. So the managers just wait for workers to quit or retire. Attrition is kinder. That's why you do it? Uh, well, we have union contracts that also have no layoff provisions in it and so forth. How can you run a business that way? It's part of being a quasi-governmental entity that uh, that's how the cookie crumbles. That's your tax money that's crumbling. Private delivery services like FedEx continue to thrive while the Postal Service bleeds billions. FedEx, UPS and others make billions because they innovate and cut costs. UPS. Postal officials like Mickey Barnett try to do that try to close money losers like these. Why weren't they closed long ago? Political pressure. Congress can kill any major change. Close post offices? No way. Save billions by adjusting benefit payments? Not a chance. So these politicians aren't dumb. What are they thinking? Well, they're thinking about re-election. Or John Stossel's cold, cold, miserable heart. <laughs> no, they can't. Quote, my wife used to complain, used to, I'm interested in that, used to complain that libertarian reasoning is cold-hearted. Since markets produce winners and losers and many losers did nothing wrong, market competition is cruel. She had a point, didn't she? Market competition is cruel. There are winners and losers. But that's better than the alternative where there are only losers. All right. The President of the United States on simple fairness. And you pay close attention to this, please. That means we have to make choices. When it comes to paying down the deficit and investing in our future, should we ask middle class Americans to pay even more at a time when their budgets are already stretched to the breaking point? Or should we ask some of the wealthiest Americans to pay their fair share? That's the choice. The Buffett rule. The Buffett rule. Rich people should be asked to pay at least the same proportion of their income as middle class people. Transparent, well, transparently fair, right? It sure feels fair, and I think it's a good political selling point. It, mm -hmm. It's a much harder point to say they're not going to pay it no matter what because the rich people are going to hire accountant and lawyer tricksters to escape it or move out of the jurisdiction. Or worse, they're going to do less, and some of them are the golden geese who provide opportunity for poor people. My response to, and these are much tougher things to say in simple politics. Uh, it's a tough battle. Obama is very clever. 
But I say to him, give me a break. You and Bush doubled spending. Under Clinton, we spent $2 trillion. Now we're approaching $4 trillion. It's the spending, stupid. Don't talk to me about taxes. And Milton Friedman was right. He says the tax levels are not what count. Government spending is what counts as a percentage of the economy. It doesn't matter if it's paid for in taxes or borrowing. Sooner. For seven years on this show, I fought with conservatives about personal freedoms. Ann Coulter says, I'm not only wrong, I'm, well, I can't say what she said. This is why people think libertarians are we're living in a country that is 70% socialist. The government takes 60% of your money. They are, uh, they're taking care of your health care, of your pensions. They are telling you who you can hire, what the regulations can be. What's to do with the drug and war? And you want to suck up to your little liberal friends and say, oh, but we want to legalize pot. Not just pot, all drugs. And I'm not sucking up to my liberal friends. I'm upset about the drug war because it's terrible. It locks up nonviolent people creates a vicious black market, and makes drugs more dangerous. Legal drugs are safer drugs. On one show, one of my favorite guests, now she's editor of Reason Magazine, took on Prohibition's current crusade, banning e-cigarettes. Should I be allowed to open this little case and do this? Yeah. Of course vaping nicotine should be legal. This is a safer product than a regular cigarette. That's because somebody figured out how to make money selling us drugs that we want to consume. The people who make money on drugs right now are people who are willing to operate in black markets. And uh, I'd rather see it all out in the light of day. Fortunately, we've made some progress. Marijuana is now legal for recreational use in seven states in Washington, D.C. Sex is also legal, fortunately. But some people get very upset if money's involved. Sex workers, prostitutes we call them, say, it's my body. Why is it the government's business if I charge money for sex? You're selling your body. That just feels sleazy, demeaning to people. Well, really, I'm renting it. <laughs> selling implies that they own it, and I still own myself. Um, it, the beauty about this country is that I get to live my life based on my morals and my values as long as I'm doing so Only in the these few counties of Nevada. In the law. And yes, I, I moved from the Midwest to be able to do it within the confines of the law. Most states say what she does is a crime. But I would think in a free country, adults should get to own their own bodies, do whatever we want with them as long as we don't directly hurt others. We should certainly be able to do what we want with our possessions. But again, politicians want restrictions. Donald Trump recently tweeted, nobody should be allowed to burn the American flag. If they do, perhaps a year in jail. What? I wouldn't burn a flag, but I have that right. It's free speech. Also, private property. If I buy the flag or make one, it's mine to do with what I want. You can criticize me, shame me, ban me from your home, but don't tell me that I cannot do what I want with my own personal property or person. In some states, even my friendly poker game is illegal. Governments ban all sorts of gambling to protect us, they say, but then they run their own gambling scam. It's called the state lottery. You can pick your jackpot, too, and win millions more. I call this a scam because the odds this government monopoly gives are far worse than any casino game. And the players are disproportionately poor people. It's disgusting that government promotes this. With 15 chances to win up to $1 million a year. Well, at the same time, some states ban versions of this. A flush. A flush. Ah! That's my friendly poker game. I was surprised that some of the players supported a gambling ban. We're not all mentally and psychologically strong enough or able to govern ourselves, which some people. The liberal wants government to do something. The, the addictive element of gambling forces, you know, the government to step in because it is addictive. Give me a break. Fortunately, other players were wiser. We are intelligent enough to know our limits. Leave the government out of it. And let me decide for myself. No, like they do. Don't take my right away from me. Don't. But politicians do. All the time. Most of the time, I just sat on the sidewalk. At first, I tried the basic homeless and cold, anything will help sign. Little help? It worked. A little bit? This woman gave me food. Oh, thank you very much. A little food. I even got offered a Maybe. cigarette. A cigarette? 
No, thank you. This man gave me some change and a job off. Listen, if you're looking for a little work, I need somebody to hand out flyers. You know, if you're around, I'll see you tomorrow and uh, Here? give you some work. Yeah. Thank you. After half an hour, I switched to this sign. Can I get a beer? I'd seen beggars trying this more honest, or you might say funny, approach. I didn't think anyone would give this guy money, but I was wrong. Thank you. You know, I'm a beer drinker myself. Yeah, thank you. I made just as much money with my beer thank sign you, as I did with my cold and homeless sign. Some people wanted to take my picture. That's funny as hell. Can I have a picture with you? Sure. My girlfriends will think that's too cute. Okay. I'll buy you a beer. There you go. Did you get it? Jenny got a crack up. We caught up with the people who gave me money, <laughs> gave them their money back, and asked them, really... why did you give? It's kind of cold outside. I'm pretty cold myself, so I'm thinking about his situation. I don't know. That guy looked pretty needy, I suppose. <laughs> I just begged for an hour, but I did well. If I did this for an eight-hour day, I would have made 90 bucks, 23 thou for a year, tax-free. That easy money is why cities are filled with panhandlers. Individuals respond to incentives. If that incentive includes giving them money for no work, there'll be more of them doing that. And the people who give... They're doing a very bad thing. They are merely perpetuating uh, somebody's misery. As long as they can stay on the streets getting money for drugs and alcohol, they're going to. Uh, and they're enabling a very self-destructive lifestyle. You're just right-wingers who are not compassionate. Mm. Some of these kids, adults, are, must be in need. Some are, but the the proper solution for that is not to keep enabling a lifestyle that so eventually just walk is going right to leave. By, just ignore them? Uh, yes. That's the advice city agencies give. Give real change to the homeless. Call us. We'll send an outreach team to help. Give to charities. Don't give to people. It doesn't get through. We're stuck with the threat of a trade war and the promise of more subsidies. Here to explain why that's bad for all of us, it's Fox Business Network's John Stossel, welcome back. So good to see you. It's disgusting what's going on. Yeah. To put the tariffs up was bad enough, and now welfare for farmers. Uh, I voted against Democrats because they were spending us broke, but now Trump's spending us broke. Yeah, it starts with $12 billion, but, you know, what if other sectors? What if steel producers and those who require steel for various Lots components? of people are being hurt. Oh, we need a handout, and we need a handout, and it, it's just Washington-directed economy. At least Trump does, from time to time, say the best of all worlds would be no tariffs. Let's all drop them. Yes. And, look, we have to give him credit. It's possible that his talking about it and his being so horrible imposing these tariffs will bring that about. It's just unlikely. Yeah, I, I really, I'm not optimistic but it sure would be great if, if that is the ultimate end, that it turns out that China and the EU are so reliant on the U.S. economy and the fact that we have so many avid consumers in this country. You know, we love stuff. We love choices. We want more of it. And that means that we are the most beneficial trading partner. And, and hopefully they will. But, you know, why? And these tariffs are a tax on us. Yeah. And, and it's, it's not a tax on China, I'm what it is, but it's mostly a tax on all of us who buy anything. Yeah, and those who can't afford the tax, they're the ones, now the leftists come in to save the day. Kamala Harris has her federal housing legislation that she wants to pass to subsidize people's rents. And that's also wrong, and it's also the exact same thing. What does that do to the economy when you've got various subsidies going out for housing and agriculture, not to mention uh, the various welfare programs. What makes our economy work, what made America grow into the most prosperous country on earth was when we began, government was 1% of the economy. Mm -hmm. Prior to Trump, it was 40%. I don't know what it is now, but every time government interferes with the decisions of free people buying and selling stuff, it makes the economy work a little worse and we need the growth because we're going broke because of medicare and social security and these tariffs just fight that growth 